Okay, I guess we'll, we'll get started. This is the last keynote uh, lecture for this conference. And of course, we saved the best for last. So <laughs> um, our, our speaker today needs, really needs no introduction. You know, uh, Xu Qian is a, really a, a legend in the bioengineering field. Um, he's a university professor of bioengineering and medicine and director of the Institute of Engineering and Medicine at UC, UC San Diego here. <clears throat> um, Dr. Chen is actually one of 14 university professors uh, in active service at the UC system. So among nearly 90,000 professors in the UC system, so he's one of the select few who's received this honor of being called uni university professor. Uh, he's also one of 13, only 13 scholars who belong to all three U.S. academies, the, uh, the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Sciences. So he's a really a, a really rare gem you can find in, in the human race. And I'm, I feel really honored to be able to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Chen received his MD uh, in, uh, from the National Taiwan University and his PhD in physiology from Columbia University in 1957. After receiving his PhD, uh, Dr. Chen uh, worked at, in Columbia as an assistant and worked his way up to associate professor of physiology. In 1969, he was promoted to professor of physiology at Columbia. And then in 74, he became the director of the Division of Circulatory Physiology and Biophysics. Uh, in 87, uh, Dr. Chen took a year sabbatical and established Taiwan's Institute of Biomedical Sciences in the Academia Sinica. Then he returned to the US in 1988 and joined the UCSD here. Um, as you know, I um, mean, in his tenure here, he has built UCSD into one of the top three of the top five schools in the, in the country in, in bioengineering. Um, Dr. Chen has re received many, many awards, and to name a few, he received the Melville Medal twice, the Ferris Medal, the NIH Merit Award, the Landis Award, the Alza Award, Zweifak Award, Possil Gold Award, and the Galetti Award. Uh, in 2005, Dr. Chin was honored with a Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award from the Asian American Engineer of the Year Award its Committee. And last year, he was awarded the uh, National Medal of Science from, from President Obama. It's the highest honor bestowed to scientists and engineers by the President of the United States. So he's made a lot of contributions in understanding uh, the, how mechanical forces uh, modeled signal transduction, uh, transduction and gene expression at the molecular level in blood vessels, and he's going to talk to us about that today. Dr. Chen. Thank you very much. Michael, it's too kind. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ko, for your marvelous introduction. Uh, I have to uh, do my very best to live up to your very kind words. I'd like to thank you and the organizing committee for uh, organizing this marvelous uh, symposium at the conference that we all enjoyed very, very much. I'd also like to thank uh, President Liang for his uh, wonderful work uh, for the society and uh, everyone uh, on the uh, planning and uh, execution of this symposium. I think it's one of the uh, best uh, that I've attended. So I'm very honored to be uh, asked to give uh, this lecture on uh, the uh, roles of me fluid mechanics and microRNA in endothelial regulation. So I first talk about the fluid mechanics uh, in general and then uh, the microRNA uh, in particular. I'd like to first uh, acknowledge uh, the collaboration of many of my colleagues. Uh, actually, I have not listed everyone here, but uh, at uh, the University of uh, California, San Diego, we have uh, uh, particularly Dr. Subramanian, who spoke uh, yesterday here uh, at a plenary lecture, and his colleagues uh, and uh, my uh, colleagues in the lab as well as the UC Riverside, headed by Dr. Zhang Shi and his colleagues, and then uh, UIUC, Dr. Peter Wang, who is here in the audience, uh, from China, Peking University, um, Dr. Nanping Wang and his group, 
group, uh, and then in Taiwan National Health Research uh, Institute, uh, headed by Dr. Zheng Jian Chu and his colleagues. I'd like to acknowledge the grant support uh, over uh, many years uh, by the NIH uh, from NHLBI, probably close to 50 years, uh, and NIBIB, uh, Dr. Pettigrew, uh, the director, is here, and uh, very uh, much appreciate your constant encouragement and support during the 10 years uh, of this uh, wonderful new institute at the NIH. The Whitaker Foundation uh, played a major role in fostering biomedical engineering throughout the country, including UCSD. Although they uh, closed uh, after completing their uh, uh, wonderful mission uh, in fostering biomedical engineering in the United States and in the world, they closed in 2006, but their effects uh, have l continued to impact us for everything we have done. And more recently, we have gotten support from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, the CERM uh, of uh, the state of California. Now, the um, mechanical forces uh, can act on the endothelial cells to modulate uh, signal transduction. Up until uh, about two, three decades ago, the focus was on chemical ligands acting on receptors to modulate gene expression and functions. But in recent years, the effect of mechanical forces, such as shear stress, has been shown to uh, affect uh, the uh, sensors for these mechanical forces and then uh, activate the uh, signaling mechanisms and uh, can uh, activate the transcription factors and uh, modulate gene expression and hence uh, protein expression and functions, uh, functions such as proliferation, apoptosis, uh, and uh, many other important functions uh, in the uh, cells and in the body. So this mechanotransduction is a very, a very important mechanism by which mechanical forces such as shear stress regulate our body functions in health and in disease. If we uh, take a cross cut of the blood vessel and then uh, we have uh, the effect of pressure is one kind of mechanical force that would generate normal stress and circumferential stress. But today our focus on the shear stress, which is tangential to the surface of the lumen of the vasculature, which is lined by the endothelial cells. Shear stress can modulate uh, endothelial functions, including proliferation and inflammation. Shear stress can uh, change the cell turnover, uh, as I will talk about later, depending upon the pattern of the shear stress, the cell turnover can be accelerated or uh, suppressed. If it's ac accelerated, it will uh, cause the cells to die and to, uh, reborn, to be reborn. And during these processes, the junctions between the uh, cells, the clefts, uh, will be opened, allowing large molecules such as LDL to enter into the endothelial uh, cell and there can be uh, oxidized into oxidized LDL. So this kind of increase in proliferation and turnover can be uh, detrimental by accumulating the oxidized LDL. Another important uh, factor in arthrogenesis is the release of chemoattractive proteins by the endothelial cells, such as monocyte chemoattractive protein, MCP1, which can attract the monocytes to uh, enter into the endothelial cell, in which uh, it becomes transformed into macrophages, and the macrophages can embed the oxidized LDL to form the foam cells, because the oxidized LDL will appear foamy in appearance on histological sections, and the accumulation of the foam cells together with the smooth muscle cells that migrate from the media into the subintimal layer together with connective tissues that forms the atheroma. Now the atheroma lesions are generally not found in the straight part of the arterial tree where the flow is laminar uh, and pulsatile, which is pulsation, but is always very streamlined. And there you hardly have uh, ever uh, the uh, atherosclerosis lesions. The lesions are generally for, for found 
in uh, regions of disturbed flow, where the flow is oscillatory in nature rather than streamlined, such as the branch regions of the uh, aorta, shown here, the iliac branch, and that's where the atheroma will form. So the, um, the uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical factors play an important role. When the disturbed flows are there, then you can tend to have this kind of lesions. But when you have uh, laminar flow, you generally have a uh, well-protected region and you don't have atherogenesis. So we're interested in me molecular mechanism mediating these effects. And we use uh, a number of flow devices. Shown here is the rectangular flow chamber. The flow chamber is rectangular in shape. And on the floor, we uh, culture the endothelial cells. And we can culture any other kinds of cells as well. And with a flow system, we can apply the shear stress due to the flow on the endothelial cells, which can be laminar in nature in this rectangular chamber. Or if we're put, putting an oscillating uh, flow, then we can have pulsatile flow. We found that it does not matter whether you have the pulsatility or not, as long as the flow is directional, streamlined, between these two kinds of flow, so the effects are very similar. We also use another kind of flow device that is a step flow chamber. There is a step here, and the entrance is very narrow for the flow, and the flow enters into the uh, widened region it will undergo eddies uh, here. It will create disturbed flow, particularly at a stagnation point, a reattachment point, where the flow is forward in front of it and behind, uh, backwards behind it. So it's oscillating in nature, and it does not have a clear direction. And this kind of disturbed flow is actually uh, also uh, similar to if you apply an oscillating flow without a direction, just oscillating back and forth without a clear direction will be very similar to this one. So throughout the talk, I will talk about the laminar flow or pulsatile flow as if they were the same, uh, because they both have forward directions. And I'll talk about the oscillatory flow and disturbed flow, because both of them lack a clear direction. Now first, I'd like to talk about this MCP1 that I mentioned earlier. How does different kinds of shear stress affect the MCP1 gene expression. And here we have uh, the uh, MCP1 expression normalized for the housekeeping gene, GAPDH, and uh, as a function of time of shear. The shearing is applied continuously throughout this period. But with the laminar flow, you can see that the MCP1 gene expression goes up transiently at first to about two and a half fold at about one and a half hours. But with the continuous application of the shear stress, the uh, gene expression for MCP1 goes down. In fact, below the static level. So constant shearing with a laminar pattern is beneficial in suppressing this kind of inflammatory gene. In contrast, if we apply disturbed flow, the uh, initial response is very similar for the two kinds of flow. But with disturbed flow, this is sustained. So disturbed flow, in contrast to the laminar flow, it will sustain the uh, regulation, upregulation of MCP1. Of course, this is uh, inflammatory in nature to attract the monocytes into the wall. Now, we, I'd like to talk about the uh, effects of uh, laminar flow on the endothelial cell turnover. Here, uh, we're plotting the cell cycle, the S phase, and G0, G1 phase, which is uh, the uh, active uh, synthetic phase, which indicates proliferation, and this is the quiescent phase, you can see that uh, without any flow in the static situation, uh, this is maintained quite well for the course of this study. But if you uh, apply the laminar flow, you see that uh, with the application of flow during the seven to Two hours of study, there is a progressive decrease of the synthetic phase and an increase in the G0, G1 phase. So the cells are uh, being uh, suppressed in terms of uh, their growth. So laminar flow, then we look at the various genes, which I'm not going to show the results. We, show, we found that the growth arrest genes are upregulated, and this leads to the decrease in the phosphorylation 
of the retinoblastoma protein. And this is a very important uh, protein controlling uh, cell growth. And this decrease in uh, phosphorylation of RB leads to cycle arrest in the G0, G1 phase. In contrast to the laminar flow, the disturbed flow does exactly the opposite. It decreases the growth arrest genes, increases the phosphorylation RB, and uh, promote the cell cycle progression, that is proliferation, will be enhanced uh, by the disturbed flow. And you can see the effect in vivo by looking at uh, this section uh, opening up of the abdominal aorta region where the uh, thoracic region where the intercostal artery openings are shown, and that is we have the disturbed flow. And right here, the albumin permeability is increased, the red uh, region, and also the mitosis is higher here as compared to the adjacent straight part of the uh, aorta. So both the uh, permeability and the uh, mitosis are enhanced. In fact, the mitosis that leads to the cell turnover and hyperpermeability. And it has also been shown by previous studies that lipids are accumulated, uh, as shown by the black uh, staining here, around the orifice of the intercostal artery where disturbed flow occurs. And atheroma in human aorta is shown to be around the orifice where the disturbed flow occurs. So indeed, uh, the uh, effect of disturbed flow on the cell turnover is seen in, the, uh, uh, in vivo. And also in vivo, we can see the MCP1 gene expression uh, around the uh, orifice of the uh, uh, entry into any aorta, such as shown here. And uh, monocyte adhesion, shown by Dr. Trusky's group in Duke, they're primarily around the orifices. So all of these indicate that the in vivo findings are supporting our in vitro studies. So taken together, depending on the flow pattern, whether it's laminar or disturbed, uh, one is found in the straight part, the other is found in the branch points, you have the following effects. That the endothelial turnover and LDL permeability is low in the straight part of the aorta and high in the branch points. And monocyte adhesion is low in the straight part and high in the branch points. Together, they make it uh, such that the straight part is anti-atherogenic and the branch parts are athero atherogenic. So the straight parts, you have the good flow, and branch parts, you have the flow that is detrimental. Now the um, classical molecular biology dog dogma is that DNA uh, is uh, transcribed into messenger RNA, which is translated into proteins, which is their, their function. It's sort of one way. But in the last decade or so, it has been shown that uh, some of the uh, DNA genes can be um, transcribed into the microRNA. They're very small, only about 22 nanometer in size, and they can uh, have uh, effects on the messenger RNA that is including uh, transcriptional repression and the messenger RNA degradation. So it exerts a negative effect on the messenger RNA. So it's a check and balance. So this is always going forward, but through this mechanism, we can uh, suppress the activity of the messenger RNA. This is like yin and yang. So this check and balance uh, give you the better precise control. The biogenesis of the microRNA is schematically shown on this diagram. At first, we have the, uh, uh, the primary microRNA, which is, uh, it can be several hundred nucleotides, and it's uh, uh, degraded, it's uh, split by enzymes uh, to get to the, uh, uh, the pre-microRNA, and that uh, will exit to the uh, nuclear pore into the uh, cytoplasm, and there, they're further acted upon by enzymes to uh, become the uh, mature microRNA to exert the functions uh, on the uh, transcription and mRNA uh, degradation. So this slide I showed before about the schematic of mechanotransduction. Instead of just looking at this, now we have the microRNA that is uh, generated from the uh, 
uh, DNA, and that can affect messenger RNA. So I'm going to talk about this part in the rest of this uh, talk. This is a slide I already showed before. The laminar flow and positive flow are beneficial in the straight part, and the disturbed and oscillatory flow in the branch points are detrimental in terms of arthrogenesis. So the kind of flow I'd like to show once more, that is the positive flow has a mean value. The one in our in vitro experiments, we use a value of 12 dyes per centimeter square, which matches uh, roughly the in vivo flow situation. As I mentioned before, you can also apply laminar flow without the pulsation. The effects are very similar. This forward direction is the key. In contrast, if you're applying oscillatory flow with a very low forward uh, value of 0.5 dyes per centimeter square, just so that we have flow going through the flow chamber to renew the nutrients uh, and so forth and remove the uh, uh, metabolites. When we do that, you can see the um, post shear stress will, um, it does have a net direction. It simulates the straight part of the aorta and the oscillatory flow simulates the disturbed flow seen at the branch points. And as I mentioned, the laminar flow without pulsation is very similar. So again, I like to say that on the one hand, we look at the pulsatile or laminar flow with a direction versus oscillatory flow or disturbed flow without a good direction. Now let's look at the positive flow with a good direction and see uh, what it does. This I already mentioned before. This uh, would uh, suppress the S phase. And uh, this is the uh, cell cycle like before. The S phase is suppressed by the positive flow and the, the uh, G0, G1 is increased. And the positive flow also decreases the BRDU uptake, which reflects the proliferation. In the static situation, you can see the bright standing of the cells. These are the BRDU standing, and this is very much reduced, very few in this positive flow or laminar flow with a direction. So this shows that indeed the positive flow decreases proliferation. Now we look at the positive shear on the messenger RNA expression. The uh, cell cycle related genes are shown here. We see that some of the genes uh, such as the RB and so forth uh, are, uh, they are affected uh, by the uh, positive shear. In general, the growth of rest genes are uh, upregulated and uh, whereas the growth of promotion, promoting genes are downregulated. So overall, is facilitating growth arrest. And then we sub submit the results to GeneSpring uh, for uh, analysis and then uh, do further uh, uh, analysis with the gene ontology uh, annotation to see uh, what are the relevant uh, uh, microRNAs. And we also did a microRNA, uh, microarray. Then we see that there are several microRNAs that are uh, if affected by the positive shear. Some of them are upregulated uh, and others are downregulated. Particularly, I like to mention the uh, uh, 23 uh, and uh, 27B, which are shown here. Those are the two uh, microRNAs that are upregulated by positive shear. They all reside in chromosome 9. So we like to know whether uh, the uh, microRNA 23B and 27B affect the positive shear induced uh, endothelial cell growth arrest. And this is uh, done by using antagomere approach. Antagomere is just like uh, uh, siRNA. It silences the microRNA. It's the anta antagonist uh, inhibitor for microRNA. First, we use the general one that is not specific for any of the microRNA that we're studying. When we do that, uh, we see that um, in the static situation versus uh, shear, you can see the uh, positive shear will suppress the S phase, as you can see here. Now we come in with antagomere specific for, uh, P, uh, for the uh, microRNA 23B. So this is microRNA 23B being added and uh, Without shear, it's virtually the same as here, but with shear, you can see 
this is not as uh, low as the uh, control using the antagonist control. This is a higher level of uh, S phase. That means the S phase really is affected by the microRNA of 23, 23B because when you suppress the 23B, this uh, S phase increases. In contrast, when you use 27B, even though it's uh, a neighbor of 23B on the chromosome and both are upregulated by the uh, shear, uh, positive shear, but 27B does not have this effect. It does not bring back partially the uh, S phase to the static situation. It's still down. So the 27B has no effect on the uh, uh, the growth uh, regulation in the endothelial cells. Now we look at the uh, effect of uh, these two microRNAs, 23B and 27B, on the uh, prostatal shear induced suppression of RB phosphorylation. This, as I mentioned, is an important, uh, 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 pro, uh, important step in the growth arrest. So we see that in the control, uh, without uh, using any uh, antagomeres, you can, uh, using only the control antagomeres, we see the um, decrease in RB by the use of, uh, 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 by the uh, positive shear without uh, the uh, suppression of the 23B. But when you suppress the 23B with its antagomere, you take away the shear effect. The shear reduction of RB phosphorylation is gone, indicating that shear induced RB hypophosphorylation is mediated by microRNA 23B. But 27B does not do that. 27B does not suppress that. It's almost the same as the control antagomere. So all of these show that 23B is the one that is important for the growth arrest in the, in the uh, endothelial cells subjected to uh, post shear. Now, all of the above are in vitro experiments. We did some in vivo experiments to show that the flow pattern does matter in terms of uh, microRNA uh, 23B expression. We use a uh, model of uh, local constriction of the uh, red com common carotid artery. When we constrict here, then you see upstream, you have the laminar flow, which is either normal or slightly lower shear stress, but it's laminar. The narrow part is also laminar, but downstream you create just like our step chamber. You have this disturbed flow, eddies, and flow reattachment, and then downstream it recovers the laminar flow. If we look at the microRNA uh, 23B expression, you see that in this region it has very good expression, but in this region of disturbed flow here, the expression is much poorer. You don't see very much uh, 23B expression. So what we found in vitro is also seen in vivo, that is disturbed flow region, it has a reduced uh, expression of microRNA 23B. That means uh, what we saw in vitro, that the positive flow uh, upregulates 23B to downregulate uh, the growth uh, cycle is seen in vivo. And conversely, the oscillated flow or disturbed flow would do the converse. So in summary for this part, the microRNA 23B affects um, the, uh, mediates the effect, uh, the anti-proliferative effect of post shear, as shown here. post shear increases 23B, and then RB hypophosphorylation, then uh, suppress the proliferation. In contrast, the oscillate shear does the opposite. Next, I'd like to bring up another uh, microRNA, that's microRNA 21. It uh, has an effect on the pro-inflammatory action of oscillatory shear. Now, this microRNA 23B can be looked upon as a good microRNA because what it does is to suppress proliferation. Uh, and here, the microRNA 21 I'm going to discuss next can be viewed as a bad microRNA because it enhances uh, proliferation and mediates the effect of oscillatory shear. So we have talked about the effect of post shear here. Now we're going to talk about the uh, oscillatory flow, and we sh I will show that it mediates its effect 
on the MCP1 and inflammation through the uh, microRNA21. Let's look at the microRNA21 in response to arthritis shear. We can see that arthritis shear will increase the microRNA21 expression. It comes on uh, quite quickly in a few hours. It, even at one hour is significant, but it becomes much higher later. Even at 24 hours, it's still high, even though it's coming down. In contrast, the post-star shear never gives you an increase. It gives you a decrease of this uh, microRNA. RNA21. So this is a sort of bad microRNA. The post eye shear drops it. Arthritis shear raises it. So arthritis shear increases microRNA21. Now the microRNA also causes monocyte adhesion. This is, we're using a monocyte analog, THP1 cell, looking at its uh, adhesion to the human umbilical vein endothelial cell monolayer. And we see that the arthritis shear increases the monocyte adhesion, as shown on the photographs and also on the bars on the results. So the arthritis shear increases monocyte adhesion. So we see that arthritis shear increases MIR-21. It also increases monocyte adhesion. Then the question is, can the overexpression of MIR-21 cause the monocyte adhesion? And we did the experiment to uh, use uh, pre mir 21 and look at monocyte adhesion, we see that indeed mir 21 increases the monocyte adhesion. Now it increases adhesion, so this whole thing may be uh, one uh, string of events, but the critical test is to use this antagomere. If you block the mir 21, what do you see? So if you use antagomere mir 21, you can see the monocyte adhesion that is caused uh, by the arthritis shear is suppressed. That means the arthritis shear induced MIR-21 is indeed mediated by the MIR-21. So the antagomere not only suppresses the uh, adhesion of monocytes, but also uh, suppresses the uh, arthritis shear induced expression of inflammatory genes as exemplified by the VCAM1 in this slide. So here, if you uh, use antagomere MIR-21, you can block what uh, the uh, uh, arthritis shear does to the uh, VCAM1. You can see with uh, the time, the, um, mere, the arthritis shear effect is gone if you suppress the MIR-21. It shows that MIR-21 really plays an important part in this mediation of uh, adhesion due to the arthritis shear. So arthritis shear then decreases the MIR-21 to uh, increase the, uh, uh, the, the uh, genes such as uh, VCAM and other inflammatory genes to increase monocyte adhesion. And then we look at uh, the mechanism how the arthritis shear activates uh, the MIR-21, then we found that uh, arthritis shear affects the transcription factor activating protein 1 or AP1. A part of that is c jung and a part of that is C-FOS. And we can see that um, arthritis shear can increase the uh, expression of c jung but not C-FOS. So as part of the AP1, this transcription factor is increased. Then the question is, is that mediated by the MIR-21. So we um, look at the effect of the uh, antagomere to anti-MIR-21. We see that we do block what uh, the arthritis shear does to the, uh, to the uh, C-Jung. It is inhibited. This effect is inhibited. CFAS has no effect. So indeed, arthritis shear increases the MIR-21 in which in turn increases the C-Jung. So it is the schematic shown here. Arthritis shear uh, affects the MIR-21. It uh, affects the C-Jung, and in turn, it affects the uh, transcription of MIR-21. Now the question is, what does this uh, uh, intermediate steps from MIR-21 to the uh, C-Jung? Then we look at all the, uh, look at the uh, uh, gene uh, ontology and uh, the relationship between various genes. We 
uh, found that the PPAR alpha is a potential candidate. So we studied the effect of uh, PPAR alpha. When we modulate PPAR alpha, indeed, we can see this affects the MIR-21 uh, activation of C-June, as shown here by the use of the antagomir, and um, you can see that, uh, indeed, the um, MIR-21 affects uh, the... Uh, the effect of uh, MIR-21 on the um, c June is uh, affected by the MIR, uh, is affected by the PPAR alpha. That means PPAR alpha is indeed an important part of this effect. And uh, this uh, leads to the filling in of this is the PPAR alpha is inhibited by the MIR-21, which normally PPAR alpha goes in here to inhibit the uh, AP1, the c June. Now, if you inhibit this, then you actually make this happen. You inhibit the inhibitor, is double negative, so the AP1 will cause the transcription of the uh, MIR-21. And the further experiments show that this MIR-21 can go back and have a positive feedback effect, but I'm not going to uh, uh, show the results on that. And this kind of in vitro studies have also been uh, validated by in vivo studies then by Dr. Peter Davies' group in UPenn, they show that uh, the endothelial cells in the inner curvature of the aorta, where the disturbed flow occurs, have uh, an upregulation or MIR-21. So this is a region of disturbed flow, and you do have the upregulation of this bad uh, MIR-21. So in summary, for this part, the MIR-21 has a uh, pro-inflammatory action. Uh, it mediates uh, the effect of osteoarthritis shear, as shown here. Osteoarthritis shear increases the MIR-21 and increases the PPAR, uh, decreases the PPAR to uh, stimulate the C-June and uh, inflammation. Now, next, the last part I'd like to talk about is uh, how the microRNA can affect transcription factors. So far, we've been looking just directly here. I'd like to look at some trans a transcription factor. And this transcription factor is KLF2. I'm going to talk about the role of MIR-92A in mediating the actions of positive shear and osteoarthritis shear on a transcription factor, which is a good transcription factor, KLF2. KLF2 is good in that it un it's anti-proliferative and anti-inflammatory. If you apply positive shear, you can see that uh, this static situation, and with time, the application of post shear keeps up this KLF2 expression, which is anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative. In contrast, if you apply osteoarthritis shear, initially it may be very similar. It's the same, but with time, you see that uh, this good uh, transcription factor goes down. So osteoarthritis shear drops down this good transcription factor, whereas the post shear keeps it up. So uh, KLF2 is affected by these two kinds of shears. Now KLF2, the messenger RNA, in its 3' UTR region, has a number of uh, sites for, uh, uh, for the uh, microRNAs, particularly this microRNA92A that we're mentioning here. And uh, if we look at the, uh, I'm sorry, this is probably too small, but this is the sequence uh, of the, uh, a, uh, from various uh, species, including human, chimpanzee, chimpanzee, and other kinds of mammals. We see that uh, there's a um, homology between the um, KLF2, uh, 3' UTR region, and uh, the uh, MIR-92A in these species. So they are complementary. They can interact with each other. And uh, then uh, we look at how the MIR-92A can affect the KLF2 expression. So MIR-92A, shown here, it will suppress the MIR, uh, it will suppress the KLF2 expression. So MIR-92A actually is, is a bad uh, microRNA in that it suppresses its good transcription factor. And this is so both in the uh, gene level and at the protein level. So the um, uh, MIR-92A uh, can uh, suppress KLF2. Laminar shear can uh, 
suppress the uh, effect, suppress the mirror 92A, as you can see here. Laminar shear suppresses 92A. Now, this is a bad mi microRNA, and the laminar shear suppresses that, which is good. And uh, so we have the laminar shear can increase KLF2. Laminar shear can suppress the uh, mirror 92A. Mirror 92A can suppress KLF2. So we have these relationships. So the question is whether uh, the uh, induction of uh, the uh, mirror 92A is uh, mediated by uh, mirror uh, in induction of the KLF2 by uh, positive shear is mediated by the mirror 92A. So here we uh, look at the effect of uh, the suppression of uh, the uh, uh, mirror 92A, then we can see indeed the effect of uh, KLF of uh, positive shear on KLF2 is mediated by mirror 92A. Now, we just talked about postar shear. I am not going to repeat everything on the ostrich shear, which is just the reverse. As uh, we uh, have shown that ostrich shear will, uh, in, will, decrease the mirror, uh, will decrease the KLF2 in the long run, and indeed uh, it is also increasing the mirror 92A to decrease the uh, KLF2. So uh, the final part I'd like to talk about is that uh, there are these... Uh, uh, microRNA, um, the, uh, the as ag aggregates, conjugates uh, that uh, includes the microRNA and uh, KLF2, and uh, these uh, aggregates, conjugates, are affected by postar shear and oscillatory shear. You can see that the postar shear uh, would uh, reduce the uh, this conjugation of the um, 92A with uh, KLF2, and uh, these conjugates are found either in these agonaut 1 or agonaut 2. In both of them, they're suppressed by the postar shear, whereas oscillatory shear does the opposite. It shows that the uh, microRNA 92A is indeed uh, activated here and suppressed here by the postar shear. Finally, I'd like to show uh, a slide indicating that uh, the in vitro data are confirmed in vivo. That is the action of um, mirror 92A uh, that suppresses KFL2 uh, messenger RNA can be shown in the uh, aorta in the uh, the rat in the rat aorta, showing that uh, if you use uh, the um, the mirror, you look at this, you can see the in vivo uh, confirmation of the effect of uh, the uh, mirror 92A on the uh, uh, KLF2, and uh, so this effect is not only shown in vitro, but also in vivo. So to summarize, the third uh, microRNA, the 92A, through the, uh, its effects on uh, KLF2, uh, it, it, because it suppresses the KLF2, it can have uh, a negative effects in causing atherogenesis. And uh, Postar shear, by suppressing this 92A, will increase the KLF2. It uh, will decrease proliferation and decrease inflammation, which is good for our uh, homeostasis. In contrast, ostrich shear increases the mirror 92A, suppresses the KLF2, and therefore enhances proliferation and inflammation. Now, the study with the microRNA, the trouble is that you have arrows going up and down and up. That's, uh, that's what uh, makes it very confusing. I hope I've been able to at least uh, transmit part of uh, what I like to say, but if you get confused, uh, if you're exposed for the first time to this, it's not surprising. So in summary, I would like to conclude uh, the three parts I've uh, presented. First, the microRNA 23B mediates the post shear induced inhibition of EC proliferation and cell cycle progression. The second part I mentioned, MIR-21, it mediates the ostrich shear induced the monocyte adhesion in the east of the, uh, to the EC and uh, hence uh, with an inflammatory response and that involves the PPAR and uh, C-JUN. 
Third one is the MIR 92A, which mediates the uh, uh, arthroprotective effects of uh, post shear through the effect on this transcription factor KLF2. And uh, this, these effects I just show sort of in a linear way, but actually they interact with each other. These microRNAs, they interact with each other. For example, when we block the uh, MIR 23B with antagomy, we did not block the effect on proliferation completely. That means there are others that are playing a role. This complex role of microRNA in uh, mediating these effects and others uh, really require a much more extensive study using the system biology approach that Dr. Shankar Subramanian talked about yesterday in his excellent uh, lecture. So actually we work together on uh, uh, studying the uh, effect of microRNA and their interactions under post shear and osteoid shear. This is just a very preliminary uh, sketch that we're going to uh, uh, elaborate on this in the years to come and uh, we're going to be able to present a much cohesive uh, result on this. So in summary, the studies on the roles of fluid mechanics and microRNA on EC regulation uh, in relation to arthro uh, genesis. Uh, it includes the um, study of uh, use application of engineering and biology to elucidate the mechanism of arthrogenesis, which is an important uh, uh, pro problem in medicine. So we have engineering, biology, and medicine. So those three are really together with the ultimate aim of understanding the problem involved in this uh, study to benefit people and improve their health. And uh, the EMB certainly is an important part to uh, make it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, any, any questions for Dr. Chen? As always, it's a wonderful you know, talk and uh, benefit a lot again. So I have one question. This microRNA21 uh, is the product of the different flows. Will it also affect the KLF2 as well you know, as a feedback? Uh, yeah, this, uh, we have not studied that particularly, but that's a very good point. The, um, all of these probably have uh, overlapping effects. Uh, we just ha have to uh, cover a much broader spectrum, yes. Very good idea, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chan. That was a wonderful talk. Thank it's you. a okay. very confusing topic, but I think you made it amazingly logical and clear, so th thank you. My question is a little bit more high level. Uh, we have many transduction, signal transduction mechanisms in biology. We have ion channels, cascade, cyclic AMP, uh, tyrosine phosphorylation, microRNAs, as you pointed out. Are there any themes to what sort of processes work through which pathways? Why does mechanotransduction seem to go through microRNAs, as you mentioned, as opposed to other signal transduction pathways? Well, you're really right. This is a very high-level question. Is, uh, how is it designed? Uh, I think body is just marvelous. I mean, this homeostatic uh, regulation, it's... Uh, just is uh, wonderful involving so many players at different levels uh, and uh, you know the interplay is not only I mentioned microRNA but at the gene level they interact uh, the network uh, and the uh, even all the uh, uh, sensors they interplay and the uh, signaling molecules such as uh, the MAP kinase pathway the um, uh, NF kappa B pathway or the uh, uh, PI3 kinase pathway, all of them interplay also. So it's a whole network at every level, at the sensor level, at the uh, signaling pathway level, at the uh, gene level, at the microRNA level, and uh, eventually even the proteins, so they uh, of course interact, they come back to regulate the genes. So it's really what we can do right now is really very limited in terms of the complexity of the biological system. So we really need to use uh, the systems approach to tease out the relationship and resynthesize them 
we have to resynthesize them into a network. Uh, so you think it's going to really be almost like a, a systems biology approach as opposed to maybe some themes or some yes. uh, higher level logic? Or is it just because of evolution and the way biology works that... Well, that, of course, uh, is also important, the evolution of the re, uh, development of the system. I mean, you see homologies, like just in the example I show for the uh, KLF2 uh, at a mere 92A in terms of homology uh, among uh, species uh, in evolution, and we can see where does it depart and what mechanism it comes in. So. It is very important, but system biology definitely is a key way to do that. But uh, I think uh, evolution, you know, involves not only animals but plants. In fact, the uh, microRNA was first discovered in plants many years ago. But uh, people in, you know, animals and human research never paid attention until a little over ten years ago, and suddenly now it's blossoming. Uh, the citation, the uh, papers published was like uh, less than 10 in the first couple of years, but now it's uh, over 10,000 already, I think. I don't know the exact count, uh, but it's uh, really mushrooming. A lot of them are clinical studies, so it has very important uh, medical applications in cancer, cardiovascular disease, and many other diseases. So it shows how you know, things can be there, and we do not know that because we didn't look at the other kind of uh, living systems and did not look at the evolution. That's uh, really true. Is it Peter? Yeah. Uh, Hugh, let me also uh, congratulate you on the, Thank you, the study that you've done and the contribution you've made to this field as a whole. I've heard several people talk about shear stress and atherogenesis, but I've never heard anyone give the level of detail analysis that you've given today at the molecular level. Uh, and so the contribution that you've Thank made you. to this field is, uh, is extraordinary. I do have a question that's rather simple, uh, and that pertains to these two categories of flow that you described, pulsatile and laminar, uh, or uh, the laminar flow and the oscillatory flow. I noticed that in your uh, simulation studies, the level of flow uh, in the laminar region was higher, and the level of flow, uh, the level of stress, I'm, excuse me, in the laminar region is higher, and the level of stress, shear stress, in the oscillatory region is lower. So my question is, where the deleterious effects occur that you showed in the regions of oscillatory uh, flow with oscillatory shear. Is it the fact that it oscillates or the fact that the level of shear stress is low in the oscillatory regions? Yes. Or is it both, the fact that there is this time variance in shear or the actual level of shear? Thank you, Rod, for your excellent question. Uh, the uh, contrast between the two, indeed, as you summarized very nicely, that is, the oscillatory flow not only has the oscillation, but also the low level. Uh, because uh, we not only did laminar flow, but also positive flow. Positive flow is the high level of flow, but with the same oscillation as the oscillatory flow. So these two, when we contrast them, is really the level. So. Uh, I think the level is more important than the oscillation. But the oscillation is there to really give you a better uh, uh, way of presenting the shear to the cell. You know, it, it can sense this mean without uh, a ma marked forward direction. But overall, it's still the, uh, I think the level is probably a little more important than the oscillation. This is, but we haven't really being able to tease out the two, uh, well, we can. We can apply very low level of shear, and it would be very similar, actually. It would be very similar. So you're right uh, in terms of those two. Excellent question. So um, what wonderful talk and a, and a beautiful story. Um, Thank you. But it begs the question a little bit, what are we missing? Do we, are there other microRNAs that are not currently included yeah. that possibly contribute to the story. And, yes. and what I wonder, my question really is, 
if you, is the data sufficient to put it into a quantitative model which could, instead of just giving you up or down changes, could actually quantitatively predict the level of proliferation or um, inflammation or the, or the reverse that you see under these controlled changes. And that, if you are able to quantitatively assess whether the current level of knowledge of the biology is sufficient to explain the results or whether that indicates that you need to go looking for other um, microRNAs. Yeah. Is, is the data good enough to do a quantitative yeah. model is the question. Thank you very much, Peter. The answer is yes and no. I mean, we have some data, uh, but only on a few microRNAs. And of course, we can use that data mining approach to look at all the other data and uh, try to piece them together. What is needed is very excellent, reliable, quantitative data and time dependent. And this Shankar has uh, stressed many times, and we're working together on that to collect time dependent data and relate one to the other, see which is affecting uh, the other, which way, and multiple uh, microRNAs, multiple genes. Uh, so it is, uh, already we have some data together what's in the literature, that's what we're trying to do, to piece it together with system biology approach, and then we can discover what is missing with that approach. Then we will uh, then go after these. I'm sure we'll find out many missing pieces that were, uh, uh, require our attention. Our one, one lab will not be able to do that all and need everyone to uh, work together. But uh, it needs to be pointed out what are the missing pieces, just like you said. So the answer is yes, we're uh, working toward that direction. Ultimately, we like to piece everything together. But the three examples I give certainly does not cover the waterfront at all. I think there are many other microRNAs acting on the endothelial cells. And uh, not only it can do other things beyond what we are looking at, but even for inflammation and proliferation, there would be other microRNAs that can do that. But we picked the ones that, from data mining approach, that seem to be the most fruitful, likely ones, uh, and work on them first. So it certainly is not exhaustive at all. Any other questions for Dr. Chen? I guess one of the one of the things I, I see positively here is that if you can arrest the, um, the yeah. effects of the, the microRNAs, then it, there's, a, there's a possibility you can have some kind of drug that can. Yes, right. Yeah, that's an excellent point. That's what when we write a grant for this, we always say that's our ultimate aim. To uh, that, which is true. I mean, we we hope that we can discover some effective. Uh, ways of intervention uh, or prevention uh, as well as intervention of uh, diseases uh, induced by atherosclerosis. And uh, that's why there are so many papers published in clinical journals on the microRNA. I mean, there, everyone is looking at the potential usage of this approach to treat disease, as I mentioned, cancer, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, all of these, I mean, because the microRNA plays such a uh, you know, intricate role in the regulation of gene expression and hence protein expression functions. It uh, gives you the check and balance. It's instead of just having the gene pushing forward, you have a way of tuning. So if you have um, not just one microRNA, a couple of microRNA, if you apply a different appropriate dosage, appropriate time, you can tune the system to our health benefit. Uh, it's an excellent point, uh, yes. All right. Well, once again, uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Sh Chen for his uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the conference is not really over yet, so there's still another series of sessions <laughs> a bit before 12.30, so at 11 o'clock. So uh, please uh, attend the, before you leave. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>